So thanks everyone for coming today. I'm gonna to be talking about the lessons we've learned uh, building observability developer experience for Hyper DX. So I've been talking a lot about observability today. Uh, so a little bit more of that, uh, but really diving deep into the actual experience part of it, building top of ClickHouse. So my background um, was co-founder and CEO at Hyper DX, another YC uh, company. Uh, we were building open source developer friendly observability platform on top of ClickHouse. Before this, uh, I was leading developer experience team. You see there's a trend here uh, at another company called IDNA, their log management startup that was basically CloudWatch for IBM Cloud and a bunch of other Fortune 500. So I've been thinking about logging observability for many, many, many years. Um, and then as Mike mentioned, uh, most recently now uh, heading the uh, observability product over here at ClickHouse uh, as part of HyperDX. Uh, so just a little bit of background on what we do. This is just a quick screenshot of our product. We basically are you know, your classic observability tool, but we really work on making it really easy to use for every engineer, uh, not just kind of like uh, observability specialists. Um, and something that's a little bit unique about our um, architecture is that you actually deploy HyperDX on top of any ClickHouse instance. Uh, so it's open source, you can spin up our stack, which will include a ClickHouse instance. Uh, but actually, if you're already storing your logs, metrics, traces in ClickHouse, which it sounds like some of the speakers here, and I'm assuming some other people here are as well, you could actually throw HyperDX on top, uh, and it will just work out of the box. Uh, it's not only just for Otel, although we certainly love Otel and support it as a first class citizen, but if you, you know, send data through any other of your favorite ClickHouse inserting tools, as long as it exists in ClickHouse, and it you know, looks like a log, or looks like a trace, or looks like a metric, um, we're actually able to make it work, and I'll do a quick demo on that later. So that's just a little bit about the product and what we're building. Uh, but since we're at a ClickHouse meetup, I figured the first thing to talk about in terms of building good developer experience is the database. Uh, it's really important to choose the right database. Uh, when you're building an observability tool, uh, you're kind of fundamentally limited by your choice of a database at the end of the day. Uh, and I've had some experiences running things that aren't ClickHouse. Uh, that didn't end as well. It looked a little bit more like that image there uh, than I think we would have liked. Um, so uh, things that you know, we've used before, like search databases, uh, those databases aren't really great for uh, frequent writes. Observability is a really interesting workload where typically your servers are super, super chatty, uh, and hopefully your developers are not searching those logs all the time, because that usually means there's an incident or an issue. In that case, you're doing a ton of writes and you're not doing many frequent reads. Search databases are literally built for the opposite use case. Um, so if you're using a search specific database, uh, they tend to not be an awesome fit uh, for it. Uh, another example are row-based databases. There is a ton of them uh, out there that are row-based. Again, they're not really awesome for observability. Uh, if you try using them, at some point they will break. Um, mainly because a lot of teams today are trying to shove really like wide or high cardinality events. Uh, and they're trying to do aggregations on top of it. So for example, you can imagine a log that has like user ID, host ID, IP address, uh, a bunch of like, you know, maybe hundreds of properties per log. Uh, and then your engineers might be like, hey, I want to figure out how many you know, requests are coming from a specific IP or user. Uh, your row-based database will probably not be very happy doing the analytics on top of you know, hundreds of terabytes or petabytes uh, of data. So fundamentally, kind of observably is more becoming a data problem as opposed to a searching problem. I think maybe 10 years ago, you say, hey, you're really trying to find needles in haystacks. These days, I think we're trying to understand really complex systems and trends. Uh, so really, you're looking for a different kind of database uh, these days. And that's what led us to ClickHouse. Uh, we were using ClickHouse before we joined ClickHouse, or slowly built on ClickHouse the entire time. Um, and it's really a breath of fresh air when we first learned about it uh, many years ago. I think the, uh, it's fast in every dimension, but I think one thing to call out is ClickHouse is uh, extremely fast at writing new events. That is very helpful, again, because servers are constantly super chatty and try to write new things to your database all the time. So being fast with writes is, uh, is really good. You're able to push a lot more of the work to the query time. So uh, again, you don't read very often, so it's great when you could be lazy during write time and then maybe incur a little bit more cost during query time. ClickHouse gives you a lot of knobs and ability to tune your schema to make that work for you at that point. Uh, the third thing is space efficient indices. So obviously you want searches to be really fast. One way to do that is to create indices. However, um, a lot of maybe less opinion or different opinion databases will create more like dense indices or really heavy indices where basically the index might be actually heavier than your data. Uh, I think 
we saw some uh, really great compression ratios from uh, Trimetric earlier. Uh, you get to kind of preserve your disk space and therefore performance because you have these really efficient indexes and also really great compression on the data. Other databases, not so awesome, um, tend to use a bit more space and therefore it becomes a lot harder to manage. Uh, it also has really awesome object storage support. So, you know, uh, S3 is great these days or your favorite object storage provider. Um, is really great these as storing, uh, storing uh, large amounts of data and ClickHouse supports it really well. And of course, it's also open source, which makes it easy to deploy anywhere you want and start adopting and spinning on your laptop. So it allows us to offer, for example, HyperDX, where you just run one Docker Compose command and everything will just spin up locally, you go on an airplane, it'll keep working, uh, which is pretty awesome as well. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit about database, um, and that's kind of why we chose ClickHouse. It's really performant, really gets us kind of that, that raw baseline of a really good database to start building top of. Uh, and then it comes a lot of the uh, user experience part of it. Um, so uh, one thing I think is important to keep in mind as you're building these kind of tools or designing observability tools for us is that not everyone is observability expert. I think you kind of get into that rhythm as we talked a lot to SRA teams or observability teams. They you know, really know the tools inside and out, um, and they, uh, you know, they might be really comfortable with really complex query languages, but really day to day, most engineers um, actually aren't in that zone. You know, most engineers are actually shipping code, they're shipping applications. Hopefully, rarely are they actually in your observability tool. Um, and because of that, if your tool is really complex to use, has really complex, you know, query languages and whatnot, uh, it can get really tricky for them to do anything meaningful in your tool. Like imagine you're an incident at 2 a.m. The last thing you want to be doing is like trying to remember what's the query language to build a specific chart or anything like that. Um, and you certainly don't want to be flipping through uh, docs. Um, so for us, we try to build for everyday developers and that means uh, starting off with a really approachable search syntax. We use a Lucene-like syntax uh, as our UI and then that gets converted into a ClickHouse SQL. Uh, everything's still a SQL under the hood. It's all ClickHouse under the hood. Uh, but we build some stuff on top of it to, uh, to support Lucene syntax. Uh, we actually do something uh, kind of uh, fun where we actually turn your search query and we actually try to uh, turn that, uh, basically that parsed uh, syntax tree into an English version as well. So we render into SQL for ClickHouse. And we also actually have an English renderer that will render that same parsed syntax into English for the humans to read as well. And this is really helpful um, at a, you know, prior product, we'd have a lot of support questions of people asking us how the syntax works. This kind of solves it all for you because there's like a kind of easy to understand version of this. Uh, maybe we'll throw LLMs on this one day. Uh, but this tends to be good enough today. Um, other things is, you know, easy UI click through filters. And then also we have a nice escape hatch to actually go all the way to SQL. So um, one thing that's really powerful about ClickHouse is it is based on SQL, it has really powerful functions. Um, and we actually let users kind of, uh, you know, break out of this, you know, Lucene mode into actual SQL mode, so you could use, you know, the full power of the underlying database uh, if you want to. Um, this is just another screenshot of showing charts. Uh, one thing we also do is making charts really easy. So while this might be, you know, a uh, some crazy charts can get to, you know, like 20, 50, 100 lines of SQL, uh, you don't have to write any of that. Basically, you just click a few lines. You have some really nice autocomplete. Um, aggregation functions and like a time frame, and it'll just generate charts for you. Uh, and if you really want, you can also copy that SQL and then paste it to whatever uh, favorite visualization tool. Uh, hopefully, it's HyperDX, but if it's not, uh, you can still do that uh, outside of the tool as well. So just making it a lot easier to get started, um, and you don't have to be like a subject matter expert or even a SQL expert to start using uh, a ClickHouse based observability. Um, I think in a prior talk, you know, we also had a uh, talk about uh, indices. Uh, so uh, being able to take advantage of indices will make your queries faster. Um, in ClickHouse, uh, primary key uh, tends to be pretty simple and something that's a little bit harder to change uh, because observability is kind of a tricky use case where you don't have like a dashboard that you know how people are gonna query. People can like just search whatever the heck they want, which is kind of the power. Um, but that also means it's really hard to optimize. Uh, so the primary key has to tend to be like pretty generic, uh, maybe timestamp plus a few other properties at most. Uh, and then you really have to be depending a lot on data skipping indices uh, and be able to utilize those effectively. Uh, it's really important to have a really fast experience for users or else you know, it's gonna feel really slow because you know, it's doing a ton of scans, uh, whole table scans, which might still be fast in ClickHouse, but overall you, know, you can still improve it with using more indices. So uh, again, another thing that we do is, uh, this is where kind of the InDesign meets uh, UX design. Uh, we're, we try to be thoughtful in terms of 
how do we actually present the user experience to people so that people kind of fall into uh, the more optimized path. So in this case, by default, uh, for example, when you start searching a word in HyperDX, we will use a token bloom filter. So we'll actually search on a token basis and use the token bloom filter, uh, skip filter, which is uh, gonna be a lot more efficient for doing basically full text search uh, than if you're doing a substring search. So by default, we try to expose that to you or you know, with filters, when you click on it, we try to uh, kind of push you towards using those bloom filtered um, or uh, low cardinality columns as opposed to using more expensive searching, basically. So we try to kind of uh, marry between uh, easy for the user and also really performant for the database. And there's like a lot of different kind of smaller like product and, and feature choices we've done to do that, but this is probably one of the most uh, uh, biggest examples of that. And the last thing kind of to talk about, I think we talk, observability, we talk a lot about you know, logs, metrics, and traces. Um, I think a lot of tools kind of inevitably turn that into three silos as opposed to three pillars. Uh, you could tell if you're having three silos if your observability product says logs, metrics, and traces on the left-hand panel. Um, to a lot of people, it's, uh, I, I, think, I think we think about them as three different signals, but really they're kind of clues to tell you a, uh, a single story and to kind of solve a specific problem for you. So uh, something that we do is we actually work on making sure we actually connect the dots together. So this is, for example, just a single pane of, I think, uh, what is this? Uh, I think this is like a span or a log uh, within HyperDX. And we work to make sure that like within a single view, you have a really good uh, idea of like what is actually going on. Um, I think you know, this is just like me labeling with like who, what, when, or why basically, uh, which is you know, a common strategy of figuring out, you know, or telling the story basically. Um, so, you know, within the single, you know, log or span, we actually tell you, you know, the entire trace, so the context around it. Uh, we tell you kind of what happened, what's actually with that span. We try to make it a little bit easier to digest as well. Um, we tell you kind of like what initially triggered it, like who is it uh, being triggered for. So uh, it would include, you know, you could attach things like user identifiers to it if you want to, and it will help you surface that up at the top level. Um, and, you know, of course, like when it happened as well. So we try to make that really easy to figure out and uh, stitch together. Uh, normally in a different product, this might be two or three uh, or four different products or panes within a product, but for us, we try to put it all in one place. Uh, this is just an example of uh, also kind of correlating events to infrastructure metrics as well, which is really powerful. There's a lot of times where you might be curious, hey, like something isn't working well. Is it because our underlying infrastructure is unhealthy? Is it because you know the uh, pod is ooming or the node is uh, hitting memory pressure or CPU usage and having CPU contention? So a lot of things like that, uh, we kind of correlate in one place. We don't really think of it as like you know log spectra traces. We just think about what are the clues you need at that given point to solve the incident and try to make it as easy to reach as possible. So um, a lot of stuff within uh, a couple clicks, uh, if not kind of in front of you by default. So that's kind of a look at uh, some of the decisions that we made. I figured I could also do a really quick demo to show you how the product actually works and how this all stitches together. Um, so hopefully, um, if uh, I did the right demo god dance before this, uh, this will work. So I'm gonna start off at uh, what I think is one of the more interesting features that we actually offer, which is session replay built completely on top of ClickHouse. Uh, all the data is stored within ClickHouse as well, uh, which I think is quite unique. Um, so I'm just gonna look over this session and what we offer is actually, you can start from the, the session. This is pretty useful because a lot of uh, inbound tickets from customers usually come from, hey, uh, at this time I hit some issue in your application, can you please fix it? And that's like the extent of the details you get from a customer. Uh, and of course, as an engineer or support engineer, you're then tasked to kind of deciphering that and trying to figure out what actually went wrong underneath the hood and turning that into an actual ticket. Um, so this is kind of like a session replay uh, of me earlier kind of messing around in the app. Um, we can actually go down to, you know, for example, this 500. This might be a very suspicious um, issue. Uh, in this case, like I'll, I can go click into it. It'll tell me, hey, there's a 500, something went wrong. This is what we see on the browser side. Um, what we do, of course, is then help you correlate that uh, to the back end as well. So why this, while this might be the, the telemetry from the front end, we also collect data uh, from your back end. So this is kind of like the request going through your server. Um, we're seeing kind of the error kind of slowly uh, pop, uh, pop up here. And you actually can click all the way through to the um, uh, exact, basically exact line of code that threw that exception um, in the back end. So in this case, 
Uh, this is a demo, so 50-50 uh, chance this will throw an error. Uh, I'm glad I eventually did hit an error for this demo to work. Uh, but basically you see, hey, this is the exact exception that was thrown. I'm not sure if that's like really easy to see now that I look at it. Uh, but you can see, hey, this is the exact exception that was thrown. Um, and this is the exact line with the exact stack trace. So we could turn basically, you know, from like, hey, like something went wrong with this application this time for me into, hey, here's the exact line of code that threw and here's the exact stack trace. Uh, and then you could turn that into a tick. And of course, it's a lot easier to solve when you have that than just, hey, something went wrong at this time, please fix. So that's just like a quick example of um, kind of that correlation action. Uh, of course, we also have like the more, uh, I would say like traditional view of being able to, you know, uh, see all your logs, be able to, um, do searches, really quick searches on top of them, be able to open a specific one, and again, kind of pivot from that log to the trace uh, and, and all the details kind of surrounding that um, as well. And it's using this uh, really easy Lucene syntax, but as I mentioned before, it's also kind of uh, easy to uh, turn this into a, uh, a uh, SQL query as well. So you know you can pick kind of whatever syntax you want. Uh, usually, if you're in SQL, you probably use something a little bit more powerful than this. But you can imagine uh, you do something like this, and it will just work. Uh, yeah. So there's also all sorts of really awesome other stuff. I know we're a little bit short um, on time. There's things like you know you could create charts really easily, as I kind of shown before, uh, and alerts uh, as well. Uh, and you know you could slice it, dice it by. Uh, let's see if we have a lot of services here. Um, yeah, kind of slice and dice it by a bunch of different things and create really complex charts, put these charts together in dashboard, build alerts on top of it. Uh, but basically this, as long as you're running ClickHouse, you have your logs and metrics on it, uh, sorry, logs, metrics, traces uh, on it, you could basically throw HyperDX on top um, and it will just start, you know, turning it into a full, you know, observability stack uh, after, you know, you fill in a few fields, which will fill for you if you use Otel, uh, and it'll just start working for you. So that's pretty much uh, it for my presentation. Any questions? Um, yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, I think on the roadmap, we do want to support PromQL dialects, uh, so Prometheus, Prometheus-like, or any Prometheus-compatible database. Uh, we don't have uh, PromQL support today. Of course, if you're storing your hotel metrics in ClickHouse, it will work. Um, and I think that's actually a really, it's actually a really cool pattern because in Prometheus, you kind of get limited by cardinality, uh, which is really painful. Uh, most of the teams that we work with actually really enjoy the ability to do really like extremely ridiculous high cardinality metrics inside of ClickHouse because you're no longer limited by the time series you have. So you can have like, you know, a metric per user, right? Uh, and that's a lot more powerful to aggregate on and get root causes on than, you know, Prometheus. So I'd say, you know, if you haven't considered it, I would say consider it. I know it's not that simple though, um, but, uh, but I think that's gonna be coming down the line. 